Welcome everyone. My name is Renee Duprell and I'm the Director of Development here at the Institute for Systems Biology. Thank you all for joining us today for ISB's Research Roundtable. This is our virtual series that we host to keep you up to date on research at ISB. Our intention is to have one of these just about every month through the end of the year, so keep an eye out for our emails. Today we'll be hearing from our featured scientists and then there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after that. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and you're welcome to submit questions at any time. I'll be monitoring those and when Jake is done with his presentation, we'll move to the question and answer session and we'll work through those questions. Jake Valenzuela is a research scientist here at ISB in the Beliga lab. His research focuses mostly on the environment such as ocean acidification and green algae biofuels. He also works very closely with our STEM education team here at ISB in our ongoing efforts to help both public and private schools provide high quality science education to students and to foster the critical thinking in the next generation. Welcome, Jake. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen right now. My name is Dr. Valenzuela. I am a a research scientist at ISB, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about how systems biology can help save coral reefs and what we can do about it. Um, I put this presentation together um, to kind of go an overview of some of the stuff that we're about to do and bring in a little bit of the science that we have done, but I do want this to be a conversation, so please ask questions towards the end um, and we'll get through it. Um, so just a little background, I'm a research scientist at ISB, I have a PhD in biochemistry, and I've always kind of been interested in understanding how um, uh, the environment operates amongst its organisms. And so uh, for me, I have a lot of different projects where we look at soil microbes to phytoplankton in the oceans, uh, to coral reefs, uh, uh, you know, the green biofuel, uh, algal biofuel, a lot of different projects. The idea is understanding how the environment interacts with us and how we impact them. Um, and so today I'm going to give us a rundown of what, what one of the, some of the research that we're doing uh, with coral reefs. But ISB has kind of had this major focus uh, lately to look at translational medicine, basically taking the work that we do at the lab bench and translating it to the bedside to actually to a patient outcome. And this has been a major focus for ISB and biomedical field in general recently. And the idea is to how do we take these new diagnostic tools and treatments that we discover here in the laboratory and how do we translate that to the patients and actually make outcomes, uh, how, how to impact patient outcomes. Um, and so we do that kind of research here where we can look at, you know, these different types of diagnostic tools that we develop uh, in, in our institution, but how do we actually make that, translate that to uh, the patient and actually drive outcomes? Well, we do the same thing for the environment. And so in this case today, I'm going to talk about uh, the marine ecosystem, or for this instance, uh, coral reefs. And so how can we use our laboratory research to actually make real world impacts on these coral reef ecosystems? And so in this sense, it's a lab bench to ecosystem kind of paradigm where we can actually do, uh, use our, our, our new discoveries, our new tools that we develop to actually make treatments for actual ecosystems in the field. And so how can we impact that? And so today I'm gonna to cover some of these, these projects. So I'll get into coral reefs. What, you know, what are they, what are corals, how they're being impacted by climate change? What are some of the mitigation strategies we use um, or that are potentially we can use to actually um, help out these corals? Um, I'm going to talk about our new collaborative initiative, evaluating coral reef resilience, which is a major um, point of focus for us, a proof of concept science that we've actually done, and other climate uh, change centric projects. So while I'm going to focus here today on coral reefs, we do have other projects in the environment looking at uh, how they're impacted by climate change. And then we'll follow up with a Q&A session. So tropical coral reefs, um, this is kind of what we think about when we think about coral reefs. It's these really beautiful, vibrant, a lot of color, a lot of biodiversity. Um, this is our, our, our perfect image of a coral reef, right? Uh, but tropical coral reefs only cover about 0.1% of the seafloor, okay? But they, they, have, they are a habitat for about a third of all marine species that are multicellular. So they're super critical for, under, for the diversity of our oceans. And so the biggest challenge to them is by 2030, it's expected that only 60% of those remaining coral reefs um, will, be, will be, uh, be around. And most of them are highly or critically threatened. Um, and so what are, what are these potentially fatal conditions that can just wipe these coral reefs off the map? 
Well, it's rising global temperatures, ocean temperature rise. And so what we're looking at here is a, a, a graph, an infographic of, July, of, of the temperature rises on the planet for the last uh, 100 or so years. And so these are the global surface temperatures um, averaged based on uh, the change in, in global surface temperature based on the last or the 20th century. And what you can see is this trend is, is, is very clear that as uh, we have continued to progress um, through this latest century, we are, the planet is getting warmer. The planet is getting critically warmer to a point where last July was the hottest uh, month on the planet on record. Okay, so this is a big problem that we're dealing with globally. And just out today, this is a new report that came out and this is all over Twitter right now and, and, and all the, the media outlets are picking it up. But rising temperatures over the last decade killed about 14% of the world's coral reefs. And that's under a decade, about eight years. 14% is just wiped off, okay? And I think uh, Jennifer Koss from NOAA, um, she's part of the, the, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, said it best that people around the world depend on coral reefs and the services they provide for food, income, recreation, and protection from storms. These are critical environments that, um, while not out here in the Pacific Northwest, are really important globally. And those impacts can reverberate throughout the planet. And so why is it important? Um, but to understand why these coral reefs are important, you really need to understand what coral is. So we call it the coral holobiome. And what it is, it's a symbiotic relationship between the coral, which is actually an animal. So the coral here, um, um, so the coral here is actually an animal. It has these little polyps and they're like, um, like little jellyfish that come out of the coral. But they have a symbiotic relationship with a photosynthetic dinoflagellate, what they call the symbiote. So these two organisms, while independent, operate together. They have evolved together to create this, what we call coral holobiome. And so a lot of people don't realize that there's two organisms that make up this coral. Um, and so they've evolved together. They, most reef building corals, um, they obtain 75 to 80% of their energy from this dinoflagellate. So it's a really important relationship to understand if you want to understand the health of the coral and the coral within the coral reef, okay? Um, and in turn, for the dinoflagellate, the coral provides protection from wave action and, and predators and other things like that, that they would normally see out in, in, the, in the environment as planktonic dinoflagellates. So that relationship is really important. And we'll get into that a little more in detail um, further on in this presentation, but it's just really important to understand the mechanisms of which these two organisms operate. So if we think of coral, um, what kills the coral, it's these bleaching events. They call it bleaching because the coral uh, turn white. And so I'm going to just break down what actually happens in a coral, coral bleaching event. So if we take a healthy coral, uh, that's going to be, you know, very colorful. It has the dinoflagellate. If you look in this, like a zoom view of it, it has the dinoflagellate inside of it. It's photosynthesizing, it's taking in that energy, and they're working together in a healthy relationship. However, if that coral becomes stressed, um, whether it was by temperature or oxidative stress, uh, whatever it might be, those dinoflagellates will release from that polyp they'll leave that polyp. And so now your, your coral starts losing 75 to 8% of that energy that it was, it was relying on. And that leaving of those dinoflagellates leaves that, that coral white bleached. is now only just the coral. It has lost its symbiote. That is what we call a bleaching event or a bleached coral. What ultimately happens if that coral doesn't reestablish a dinoflagellate within its polyps, it, excuse me, it will die. And it'll die. And what happens is other algae will just come and use that coral is structure. It just becomes a rock. Okay, and these, ble these bleaching events, I like to analogize them to uh, a fire, a forest fire, where you have this lot of diversity uh, in, a, in a forest. You can have one single event, like a heat wave, come through and wipe out a lot of that diversity, and you're just left with the, the leftovers from that event. Now, the mechanism at which these happen or the recovery of these happens are very different, but the analogy still stays the same. This is an event. So when we talk about other climate change outcomes like say ocean acidification or melting of the glaciers, those are very slow happening events. With the rising temperature you have uh, for the corals, you have a bleaching event in which a heat wave comes through, it gets too warm for these corals and they bleach out their symbionts and then they can't recover. So it's an event that happens that wipes them out. Um, and so if we look at the, the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just came out recently in 2021 with its sixth assessment. They've been doing this uh, for a couple of decades now. What you see are these different lines are different scenarios 
in which what we can do as, as, as humans on the planet, if we achieve these different scenarios, we can mitigate the rise in temperature of the planet. So this, this SSP1 is the top scenario. If, we, if everyone started using sustainable practices and we really drove down our CO2 release into the atmosphere, this is what we would expect. We could level out at about a one and a half degree increase in the, overs, um, in the surface temperature. However, this, 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 this uh, scenario five, um, this is if we don't do anything. And we can expect a five degree Celsius increase in the global temperature of the planet. Okay, so these are different scenarios when we look at these kind of models. But the most important things if you look at these different models is that you have these events, what we call 10 year events. Uh, these are things where like you have a really brutal heat wave that comes through. Usually typically those only happen once every 10 years. Okay, so the frequency of those are once every 10 years. However, with the increase in climate change or the increase in, in, in expectations that we have for these scenarios, the frequency at which those 10 year events happen are start to occur a lot more. So we're, we're, starting to we're gonna start having heat waves happen a lot more often. Um, and what that means is, you know, a lot more heat waves, a lot more bleaching events we might have um, out in these tropical coral reefs. And so just with where we're at right now, we're gonna start seeing 2.8 times more um, um, high temperature extreme, extreme events. Uh, if we if we go with the latter scenario where the, the planet is expected to go up four degrees Celsius, it's going to be about you know nine nine to ten times as frequent. So every year we're going to be having these heat wave events. So this is to keep in, to keep in mind you know what is the the, the crisis we're approaching, um, and this is a good shot of how devastating these kind of events can be. So this is a the, the Great Barrier Reef um, right around December in the winter, um, our winter in the summer for um, the southern hemisphere where you had a healthy uh, coral reef in the Great Barrier Reef, you had a bleaching event and the whole reef just went white. And we lost a bunch of coral, lost a bunch of diversity. And once they die, they're not, I mean, obviously not gonna come back, but this, this kind of filament algae lands on the coral and just takes over and just decimates it. So this is what we're, we're approaching, we're seeing. These are the kind of events that we have to deal with um, going forward. And they're gonna be more and more frequent as we, as we continue on um, in this uh, century. So the coral reef crisis is already here. There's been mass bleaching events. They happen all the time. Um, you know, with the IPCC, we're expecting, there's predictions are, is that we're gonna lose about 70 to 99% of the coral reefs um, if we get above the temperature of 1.5 or two degrees Celsius of warming. Okay, so what that means is we have about 15 to 25 years to do something, which it, <laughs> I used to have this slide a few years ago, it used to be, you know, 10 to 30 years. Now it's getting shorter and shorter, we're running out of time. So what can be done about it? So there's four principal strategies that we can do. One, mitigate. That is basically, can we reduce our CO2 emissions, which would lower the temperatures of, that, of the planet? Um, this is something we can't really do um, as researchers here. This is a, more of a global problem. But the other ones we can focus on are either to protect certain areas. So how do we develop marine protected areas or um, ecological refu uh, refugia? Can we repair some of these systems? So can we assist the evolution of some of these organisms? Can we restore degraded ecosystems? Can we you know, transplant or um, um, uh, can we you know, create new reefs for these, for these, for these corals? Uh, we can adapt them, which means we, can we relocate our activities? So can we you know, preserve some of this stuff? Or can we relocate species? If we have species that we think can perform better in different locations, we could potentially relocate them. Um, so these are different strategies we're trying to think of in order to take action. And so part of this uh, new initiative that we're working on with um, um, partners around the globe is what are the, it, in order to take action, we need to understand what are, um, what makes corals resilient, right? What are the genes, the microalgae, the, um, the bacteria that are associated with the, the most resilient corals? Uh, if we understand that, this, you know, we can actually uh, try and take on some of these actions to mitigate um, uh, the loss of these coral reefs. So the solutions that we've come up with is just to standardize a coral stress test um, that can rapidly assess bleaching events across co different corals in different locations. This standard approach is kind of like the basis of the foundation for what we're going to do. Um, we need to go out into the field, figure out what are the, the kind of diagnostic um, thresholds that would predict bleaching in these different coral species at these different coral locations. And then what we wanna do is look at the global comparisons of the genes and mechanisms um, that can predict or can uh, infer the coral resilience of these organisms and 
build a predictive model. This is our systems approach. Um, and then with that, how do we actually create a knowledge base that we can uh, provide the public with an idea of how this can be done? Um, and so this is the, 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 what we call the global search project that is spanning um, different institutions across the, 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 the globe. So here are some of the, these are our main collaborators. So we have Christian Volstra from the University of Constance in Germany, uh, Dan Barsis from Old Dominion in Virginia, Ileana Bombs, a professor of biology at uh, Penn State, and Line Bay over at the Australian Institute for Marine Sciences. And so each of these uh, researchers are some of the, the top researchers in their field in looking at coral um, uh, resilience and physiology and they're all going to focus on different areas on the globe and perform these standardized assays. And so if you look here, we have the Caribbean, which we've done by Ileana, uh, the, the Marshall Islands and the Pacific Islands will be done by Dan, um, Christian Volster will handle the Red Sea, and uh, Lyon will handle the, the, the Great Barrier Reef. So the idea is that we're going to have different areas around the globe where we sample these different types of coral. Uh, so we're going to look at four different species of coral. We're going to look at Stylophora pistillata, Acropora, Pustulopora porites is another one. And the idea is we have a, 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 a we have a diversity or a spectrum of different types of coral from across the globe in order to identify what are the common signatures of resilience or what are the differences. And so by having this kind of global search allows us to really kind of um, probe what are the necessary requirements to have a resilient coral. Um, and so what we're going to do is put them through what's called a coral bleaching automated stress system, bringing the lab to the reef. And so uh, Christian Volch and Dan Barson has created these sea bass systems. Um, and what they are is these, they're democratized units that are, that are lo low cost, but very efficient actually testing, uh, you know, at the thresholds or the temperature thresholds at which coral will bleach. And so by having these units, we can standardize our approaches across the globe and actually sample the, the gene expression signatures of those corals. And so this is just a typical, um, uh, what we call sea bass assay or a diagnostic test um, used to capture these dynamics. So in, these, in these, uh, these, these water systems, we can ramp up the temperature of the seawater to different set stages. And what we do is we, we ramp up that heat at different um, temperatures. So for, the, for instance here, we keep one at the control at 30 degrees Celsius, uh, the next one will go up to 33 degrees Celsius, and then the highest one will be 36 degrees Celsius. What this does is kind of is used as a proxy for a bleaching threshold for this organism. Um, we let them recover back down to a, the, the temperature at which they started. So for this, in this case, 30 degrees Celsius. And after a period of recovery, we sample the gene expression. Um, and we do that and for this, this next experiment. We're doing it at different uh, time points so we can really understand the dynamics of the gene expression in each of these corals. Um, and again, when I say coral, what I'm really talking about is the coral holobiont, right? So it's going to be the coral, the animal itself, and also the dinoflagellate. And so we'll have both uh, organisms sampled over time in these kind of sea bass assays. The other thing we're using is, 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 is because we're collaborating with um, Ames or the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, they have what's called a sea system in a box, a sea, a sea simulator. Theirs is a, a, it has the ability to do a lot more parameterization and control um, ad additional um, environmental parameters. However, it's really, really expensive, really, really large. And so it's not something that can be democratized across different sites. But it, we're going to use that to actually kind of um, uh, assist in our understanding of what the sea bass can tell us based on environmental parameters. But the idea is the ISB is going to get this gene expression data back, and we're going to use our systems approaches and our network analysis, and we're going to try and understand the differences between the organisms. So, for instance, if we had a, a gene regulatory network and we look at the expression profiles of the coral of, say, Stylophora pistillata, we're going to have a, a unique kind of stress response network. However, if the, 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 the postulopora one might be very similar, but also different. And as we go through the different species, the idea is will a kind of uh, 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 will a, a kind of um, common signature of resilience emerge between all the organisms? If that's the case, then we can understand, uh, uh, you know, what is it that makes a coral unique or coral resilient and how is that can be, can we assay that globally with different uh, coral species, right? So once you figure out those signatures, 
then we can just go back out into the reefs. Instead of running them through the sea bass assays, we would just use um, some molecular tools to identify, do these corals have these signatures? Do they have these um, mutations that we're expecting or, or whatnot? Um, and that way we can, instead of sampling all these different corals with these big, large assays, we can just go through and probe them and say, yeah, we expect that this coral can survive this X amount of temperature. Okay, and so um, that is the main outcome of that initiative. And I think it kind of um, builds up off what we already kind of um, have done recently. So we recently just published a paper. It's kind of a proof of concept paper about the proposed strategy. And so I'm gonna run that through right now, um, just real quickly. So um, what we did is we worked with our collaborators and we sampled the same um, species of coral um, at two different locations across the Red Sea. So this is the Red Sea here. We have an eyelot coral and a cow's coral. Basically at the eyelot in those reefs, that temperature is around 28 degrees Celsius while the cow's coral reefs are around um, 31 degrees Celsius. So they have different environmental um, constraints where they're growing, but they are the same species. We ran, oops, we ran them through this sea bass assay. So we ran the corals through kept them at 30 degrees, we ramped them up to 33 and 36. And then we looked at the, the, the physiological aspects of the coral and see you know, what are the differences in the response to the thermal stress. And what we see right away, so ICN um, is the cow assay, so it's up here in the north. Uh, our CRS sites are down here in the south. Uh, what we see is that the, 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 the CRS sites, the central red sea sites, they, this is what we're looking at is what's called a um, photosynthetic efficiency curve uh, of the coral. So photosynthetic efficiency is the ability to convert light energy. So for photosynthetic organism, converting light energy to chemical energy. So it's a proxy for health. Okay. So just when we see FPO for M, just understand it's a proxy for health. So if you were completely efficient at converting light energy to chemical energy, you, you're, you'd be one, right? You'd be a one-to-one -one unit. Uh, for, for a good healthy coral, we expect it to be around 0.6, okay? So what we see here is that the healthy coral for the CRS sites, the Central Red Sea, uh, that they, their, their FV for M, their photosynthetic efficient, doesn't really change with the increase in temperature. Here, so here's 33 degrees Celsius, here's 36. Once you get to 39, they all bleach. So here's some of the, some of the corals, uh, some pictures of them. You can see that they have a lot of color here. In the early on um, at the 30 degrees Celsius, but once you get down to 39, they're all bleaching, they're all going away. And so they're losing their, their symbiote. The interesting part is that the, the ICN coral, the corals that are more north, um, the ones that live in cooler uh, habitats, they actually start responding right away to 33 degrees Celsius, 36 degrees Celsius, um, but they also bleach at 39 degrees Celsius. So the difference just from their photosynthetic efficiency, you can tell is that there's different mechanisms at play between the two um, um, regionally diverse or regionally separated coral. Um, and you can see that here again. So you have some of the coral that stay really colorful, but then they start bleaching uh, down at 39 degrees. So what's happening? So you have healthy coral, you, they start stressing out as you increase that temperature and then ultimately they bleach. What we really wanna know is what's going on um, transcriptionally, what are the genes doing? How are they responding to the difference in temperatures? And so what we did is we did um, a, a differential expression analysis um, with, on the coral and on the symbiome. And so what you clearly see is that with the coral, so this is called a, a principal component analysis. Essentially, it just means that um, each dot represents a, 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 a sample um, of the transcriptome with a coral. So we had corals from the Gulf of Aqaba, or this is ICN corals, and then we have CRS corals, central red sea corals. The closer you are to each other on this, on, on, in these dimensions means they're behaving similar. And so what we see for the coral is that at 30 degrees to 33 to 36, the ICN corals, or the cooler corals, are all behaving differently at different temperatures. But what we see from the central red sea corals is they're all behaving very similar. That temperature is not able to differentiate um, their, their, their expression changes. Okay, so it's a very different behavior, even though these are the same coral, same species of coral. Now for the, the symbiont, the actually the dinoflagellate that's associated with the coral, um, what we see is that you can just, the, the gene expression doesn't really separate out by temperature anymore. It just separates about by region. So you have um, warmer uh, coral over here and you have cooler coral over there. Um, 
And so this is some of the outcomes we're seeing is that we're starting to see different phenotypes or different um, you know, phenotypic thermal tolerances between the two corals, even though they're the same species. Um, and so one of the things that we did notice is a difference in mechanism that is potentially important for thermal tolerance, and that's what's called front loading. So front loading is a, a kind of mechanism in which if you're a coral that's already at a warmer location, you are already expressing those important genes you need for thermal tolerance. And so if you look here, uh, this is the CRS corals you have here. If you look at the same genes from uh, the ICN, the cooler corals, versus the Central Red Sea um, corals, which are the warmer ones, these same genes are already being turned on at 30 degrees, 33 degrees, and 36 degrees Celsius. And so you look here, you can see that as we increase that temperature for in those sea bass assays for the ICN corals, as the temperature increases, you start to see them respond as these uh, Central Red Sea corals are already responding. And so this is a potential signature we can look for when we go out to the, to the environment and see, are some of these corals already at their limit? Have they reached their plasticity uh, limit where they can actually um, you know, um, increase or do anything genetically or uh, expression-wise to, to mitigate some of the heat stress that they're seeing? The other thing we did is we actually sampled their, the, the, the bacterial community composition of the corals. So um, just like the gut microbiome or the rhizosphere in plants, there is a microbiome associated with the coral. So the coral has these little polyps and in the environment and there's bacteria all around them. And so when we look at the bacterial community composition of the corals, what we see is that the, the, the community composition is very different based on region. Again, same species, but the region has already kind of changed the, the community composition. So again, what is the impact of that community composition on the coral? So this is something that we're also gonna look at going forward with the Global Search Project is how the microbiome will affect the gene expression of these corals in different locations across the globe. Um, and so with that, I just wanna summarize a few things and then I wanna to get to some of your questions. So I know this was a lot of science. I really hope this is something that we can just jump off and start a conversation with. Um, but just to summarize uh, from the science side of, the, side of things, there's differential thermal tolerance strategies between different regional sites. So what we can expect from the global search project is that there will be different strategies if you're in the Caribbean versus the Great Barrier Reef, Red Sea, or the Marshall Islands. We're expecting these, these regional sites to have very different responses, although they're being the same species. Um, different temperature has impacts on, or temperature impacts differently the either the coral or symbiome. So while this is a symbiotic relationship, temperature will affect coral very differently than it will um, the symbiome. Um, so uh, coral holobionts and the microbiomes from the cooler sites show more resilience responsiveness. So what we've seen is that the cooler sites are able to respond more to this thermal uh, stress compared to uh, the warmer climate um, corals, that those seem to be more resistant, that they're already kind of um, reached their limit of responsiveness. Um, and we also see that SNPs, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, they can actually explain some of the expression variation that we're seeing between these two genotypes. And so that is one of the things we're really focused on going forward is, can we identify SNPs that actually are the signature we might be looking for when we go out into the environment? Um, and so those are, those are some of the things that we see from this proof of concept paper that we're actually you know, uh, translating that into the, the work going forward in the next three years. Um, towards the signature resilience, um, our work supports the existence that there will be signatures. We do believe that they will see some kind of signatures across the different species of coral, across the different uh, species of symbiont, and across the globe. Um, and it's really important to see, you know, how we can actually identify those signatures and how we can actually go through and screen different corals um, just phenotypically or uh, genotypically um, without having to submit them through these kind of uh, thermal tolerance assays that are very uh, resource heavy and, and time consuming. Again, ultimately the idea is that having these signatures, we can actually take action. Can we assist the evolution towards these more resilient corals? Um, can we restore the degraded ecosystem based on what we know about which corals will be resilient? Um, what does that mean for relocation of species if you wanna do it that way? Or which, you know, if you knew which um, corals are more, or corals or coral reefs are more vulnerable, Maybe that'll influence um, how we can actually select which marine protected areas are more important um, to, to at least or more immediately require action compared to ones that don't um, need immediate action going forward. 
Um, and then the last thing I want to do is, uh, uh, you know, this was a lot of work on coral reefs, but we also do a lot of, in the Beluga Lab and ISB, we do a lot of work on other ecosystems that are really important to biogeochemical geochemical cycles on the planet. So one of the things we also, we also work on are, are diatoms or phytoplankton, which account for about 20% of the primary productivity on the planet. And so diatoms, um, we have been researching for a while, is trying to understand what they will do as we expect the oceans to acidify uh, by the end of the century. And so what we're seeing right now is that some of the diatoms may be more resilient um, as they go forward in time when the CO2, CO2 levels rise. So they may, be do, they may do a lot better in these, in these ecosystems. The problem with that is if you ever have a, a species do um, overwhelmingly well in an ecosystem, that's usually detrimental to the diversity of that ecosystem. And, and for most of these habitats, a strong um, diversity is really what you want. You don't want a single species to take over. And so uh, this is work that we continually do to do um, going forward in the Beluga Lab. The other thing we look at is microbial interactions and how those impact uh, other uh, greenhouse gases, particularly nitrous oxide and methane. And so those microbial interactions between um, organisms actually release a lot of the methane that we have in the atmosphere or a lot of the nitrous oxide we have in the atmosphere. So one of the things that happens a lot on the on, on terrestrial surfaces is we do a lot of agriculture and we're starting to see a lot more nitrous oxide getting released into the atmosphere and mainly that's done by microbes and so what we're trying to do is understand those kinds of uh, mechanisms that actually drive into off gassing uh, in the atmosphere in hopes to like mitigate some of the the, the increases in the greenhouse gases that we're seeing um, so with that i really want to thank you for your time I know there was a lot of science there, but I'm trying to keep it um, you know, at 20, 25 minutes. I really want to thank the Beliga Lab, Nitin Beliga, the PI of the lab, Sirdar and Monica for their support. Uh, Sarah Frias Torres, who's part of the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, who was really instrumental in us getting this, this foundation grant. Uh, Chris Volstra, Dan Barshis, Ileana Bombs, uh, Lion Bay over at Ames, all these collaborators. Um, we're really starting to kick off this net new initiative for the Global Search Project. Um, so this is the first year of this that, that we're doing that, and it'll be going on for the next three years. Um, I also want to throw a little plug in. We are so for those that um, you know that are attending that that are looking for postdoc positions. We do have postdoc positions at a few of these um, projects, looking at diatoms, the microbial interactions, and the coral, and then student interns. I know there might be a lot of students on online right now. We are always looking for student interns to gain experience in the laboratory or using data analysis. And a lot of the work that we do is environmentally related. So if any of this kind of stuff really kind of piques your interest, I encourage you guys to go to the ISB website, uh, apply for internships and stuff like that. And then just as just a, a quick look at some of our collaborators who just recently got back from a trip from the Red Sea where they were collecting coral and running through the sea bass system. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll go ahead and take some of your questions. Super, thanks, Jake. That was great. And I do have a few questions just to kick us off. Um, what are some of the mitigation strategies you are excited about? And uh, just as a reminder to our guests, um, you can pose your questions through that uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I do see the one person who used chat, and that's fine. I'll, I'll get to that one. Uh, so a couple of the mitigations, but the one I'm really excited about is the microbiome mitigation strategy. So. Recently, there, and we're in collaboration with these, these, uh, um, these investigators, is that they were looking at how we can use um, basically probiotics with the coral, and does that actually give off more, or does that confer more resilience? And what they saw was, yeah, if you change the microbial community um, associated with those corals, the coral, the coral will behave differently, and it might help them um, when you have a thermal um, stress. And so that's, that's one that is really exciting to me because, I mean, just imagine that, you know, instead of, you know, doing any kind of gene editing or any kind of relocation of corals, if you could just farm, you know, some probiotics in these coral reefs, you might be able to help some of them survive these heat waves and these, these increases in, um, um, or the, you know, the, the, these bleaching events. And so that is one I'm really excited about. The other one I think I'm really excited about is just marine protected areas. I think, um, you know, uh, heat stress is the number one cause of coral bleaching. 
but it's there's other little factors involved like pollutants um suns there's a lot of pollutants and sunscreens things like that um overfishing is another kind of secondary um kind of problem that we have so anytime you can create a marine protected area you limit those secondary impacts um, um, that can actually be futile to some of these coral reefs so um, those two are really exciting i think you know the evidence is there marine protected areas work really well and they're really sustainable for fisheries and stuff like that so those two i'm really excited about again the microbiome shifting the microbiome or using probiotics or um, marine protected areas okay Okay, thanks. Um, let's see, why do the coral die when they lose their photosynthetic symbionts? Uh, no energy, I assume? You are correct, no energy. So, so two things. One, these two organisms have evolved together. Okay, so it's not like just, um, hey, let's dance on this day, right? They have evolved together, so they work together. So for the, the dinoflagellates, like I mentioned, they, they account for about 70, 80% of the energy and nutrients that they're that the coral is receiving. And so over millions and millions of years, you've evolved together. If you lose that relationship, if you lose that dance partner, you don't know what to do. Mm. And so the coral, and you know, they, they, the, those dinoflagellates eject, and there's only like a limited amount of time where the, the dinoflagellates can come back into the polyps. If it doesn't happen, they lose too much energy and they start to have necrosis and they start to die and they bleach. Um, and so, you know, just like any of the other symbiotic relationships, if you don't have that, you're going to lose it. Um, you know, it's a, there's a lot of different symbiotic relationships in the environment. Um, and so, you know, losing one of those partners is really detrimental. That's, you know, that's what evolution does. It kind of streamlines your, 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 you know, what you can do. And if you lose that partner, you're not going to survive it. So, yeah, the main thing is that they, they lose the energy and that, you know, it's not easily replaced. Yeah. This, this discussion is both terrifying and hopeful at the same time, Jake. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, look, it's, it's, it, it should be hopeful. It is okay. terrifying, but it should be hopeful that we, we know so much more now um, and we know what to do. It's a matter of will at this point. I think, um, you know, we, there, there's no denying what's going on. Um, the evidence is very clear. The patterns are very clear. There's no, there's no real argument against it. What it is is the will of what we want our futures to be. Um, you know, my very first publication was from my undergraduate degree at Cal Poly in, in San Luis Obispo. And we were researching, um, this was 2008, but the work was done like in 2006. But we were researching how um, intertidal snails or mussels, how they were shifting in their, in their, their, their regional um, locations based on increasing temperatures. And this was 2008. So this was when I first started you know, learning about the stuff. At the same time, we already knew at that point that coral reefs were in jeopardy and there's a lot of them are in crisis. We also knew about ocean acidification, all these different things. And it's been 14 years now and we're still kind of in the same area. So yeah. again, it's not a matter of, of you know, how or why, it's a matter of will. And I think um, the biggest thing we can do is really you know, make it a focal point in what we do. Um, you know, strategically either with your daily life or you know, how you vote with your own dollars, et cetera. How do you want to address some of these things? I think the other thing is, you know, we don't have tropical reefs up in the Pacific Northwest, right? And so the question is, well, how does that impact me, right? Well, if you lose 30% of your marine biodiversity in a different location, that is gonna reverberate across the globe. Um, they, the, the reefs provide a lot of habitat for incoming and migratory animals and fish and food webs and all that stuff is integrated that's what systems are that's why we always use systems biology and systems thinking you have to understand how one location can affect another and um you know all, all this kind of stuff is it's going to affect us we're going to see a lot of these things transition and again it's a matter of will of what we want to do about it um yeah. but it's, it starts with understanding the problem and i think we're at that point where we really understand what's going on are you careful about what kind of fish you eat and where it comes from? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, even, yeah, that I try not to eat a lot of fish just because yeah. I feel like that's such a sensitive fishery. Um, I mean, just fisheries in general are really sensitive. Um, I try not to eat a lot of fish. I try to do like reduce my meat consumption. That is mm -hmm. another thing, right? These are little things we can do individually, but I yeah. think, you know, 
that is an individual problem. I think the major solutions are going to come systematically, changing the system, right? Um, and that, that's something that uh, requires a lot of you know public input to do that, right? I, I, I like to think back to littering. Uh, littering used to be a big problem. I'm not that old, but I know it was a bigger problem back in the 60s and 70s where people would just litter. And then it became this thing where if you saw someone on the highway litter, you'd just be furious. If, yeah. if you saw someone throw a bag of trash out the window, you'd be furious. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of mentality we need to start developing is, you know, mm-hmm. if we're just decimating fisheries or we're just eating too much cattle or just continue to, to, to just guzzle gasoline, we need to get furious about this stuff. These are changes that are happening that are no longer debatable. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, in agriculture, the plants are developed to fit in and thrive better, i.e. a higher yield. Can corals be planted? Can we change corals the same way? Is the DNA a relatively simple one? Uh, yes, we can. So that's what assisted evolution is. It's not a very simple one. I, not, nothing, even, even for the agricultural plants, none of that is simple. That is literally hundreds of years, right? Crossbreeding. And now we're at the point where we can you know, sequence things and do genetic engineering, but it takes a lot of time. Now, coral is very complex, but it's no more complex than maize or corn or soybean or anything like that. But it just it takes a lot of research to understand what's gonna happen. So um, the other thing I would caution is unintended consequences, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say we come up with a genetic saying germ, like, oh, we need to make, mutate this one gene just for simplicity. Well, we don't know what the unintended consequence is of mutating that one gene and then all of a sudden trying to transplant a bunch of those coral throughout these reefs. I think the best thing to do would be to use something that's already natural, which is like the probiotics or something like that, because then you're not really um, manipulating some of these these organisms. Um, that being said, the original question was, is it like you know, the agriculture? Yeah, you can get there. I mean, part of this, people have developed CRISPR technologies for coral and the symbionts. I think that technology is there. The know-how is there. I think we're trying it, um, but it's going to take a lot of work because even then, there's only so much you can gain from that, how much, so much um, temperature shift you can gain from that. Um, but it is something we're doing. So assistive evolution is something that's really big where we should say, we want to evolve these corals to do this and and withstand this amount of temperature and stuff like that. Okay, great. Um, you've mentioned systemic change a number of times. This question is, how serious is the threat of the coral reef crisis, ocean acidification, et cetera, being taken on a governmental basis? Do you have a sense of what policymakers are ready to do? <laughs> that's a pretty good, that's a loaded question given what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, I mean, the, the, way, the way I break it down is funding. Right, like we get a lot of our funding from federal agencies. NSF, which handles a lot of the environmental work, is a very, very small budget compared to like NIH, NIAA, okay. stuff like that. And there's a good reason for that. I think when you talk about human health, it's a very personal problem. Mm-hmm. What would you be willing to spend to make sure your family is healthy, your, your son, your mother, your grandmother? What would you be willing to spend to make sure that that they, you know, are healthy and they can, you know, withstand some kind of complication. When it comes to the environment, it becomes very non-personal and, you know, it, the changes in the environment happen very, very slow. So they're easily ignored, right? Mm -hmm. I think what you, you, we've known for a long time about increases in CO2 causing increases in, in, in um, temperature and all these climate changes, um, problems that we're seeing like ocean acidification, you know, glacial melts, et cetera. We've known this for 50, 60 years. We've known it. The problem is long-term investment to actually mitigate these practices aren't there. It's just really hard. The only, the only thing, the only one that really has the deep pockets to do that is the government and the government gets turned over a lot. And so a lot of times we see funding spikes and they get pulled. We see funding spikes come back and they get pulled again. So that's the hard problem. But with the, you know, with when it comes to health, like I mentioned, it's so personal. You don't want to pull that health or that 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 funding for those health initiatives because again, you know, we want to we want to solve a lot of these diseases. We we don't want to be afflicted by a lot of this stuff. And and rightfully so, but we need to start putting the environment up at that same level. 
um, because we're running into a lot of different crises, not just coral reefs, we're running into increases in the, the sea level. That is something that's happened so slow that it's gonna, until it's here, you're not gonna notice it. But there's low line areas where, I mean, you can see right now, it's becoming more frequent in New York City where you have these, these, these floods and the subways flooded and all this kind of stuff happening. Those are gonna become way, way more frequent. And yeah. you know, there's gonna be a lot of migration, human migration, when we start to see these kinds of areas get hit really bad with these sea level rises. Um, but these are slow and oncoming, right? I mean, no one, it's, it's not a problem until it's at your doorstep. Um, and so yeah. that's really hard to solve um, without buy-in from the general public. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a nice segue into my final question which is, um, what is the biggest way we, the public, can make a difference? So this is a good segue. So um, like I said, long-term investment is kind of hard mm -hmm. um, when you think about money. But the one area where you can have really long-term investment is in students, the younger generations. Those are the people that are going to be dealing with these problems. If we invest in them now, they are the ones that are able to make the generational changes we need. Um, and so we need to do a better job as scientists. I think ISB does a great job at this, but in general, scientists need to do a better job at communicating what we know, make it translatable to the public. And that starts with students, it starts with teachers, and it starts with those stakeholders because those are the, if you can, every generation um, teach these students how important the environment is over time, instead of having invested in that with money, you have investment in the human capital, they will make the changes, they will force those changes. Um, and so I know from, you know, speaking to my parents or just other people, more uh, adults, climate change wasn't really discussed in high school or anything like that. And I think stuff like this, um, some of the work that we're doing here at ISB with the, the C program or um, ISB's education programs is really getting the students to understand the problems, not in a, a hopeless, way but in a way that says these are problems that are coming but we can we have solutions for it. we have things we can do and we need your help and we need you to think outside the box we need you to to, to think um systems you know have systems thinking understand how you can affect someone else and how that other person can affect someone else and how it all reverberates throughout all the systems we're engaged in whether it's um you know political systems whether it's um, community systems environmental systems it's all connected it all is, is dependent on each other. I think teaching students how to think that way makes them, you know, care about that more when, as they're adults. Um, and so I think that's the biggest place you can have generational changes by investing in students, investing in education, specifically STEM education, um, and so that they can understand the problems that we're dealing with. Because, you know, I like to think back, uh, I have a new niece and I have a niece on the way they're gonna be born where this is, they're gonna be dealing with fires all the time. Um, they're in California, they're gonna be dealing with fires all the time. They're gonna be dealing with water issues all the time. And then throw on that, okay, coral reefs are gonna start disappearing. They're gonna have ocean uh, pH rises. They're gonna start seeing really frequent um, atmospheric events or, or weather events that are real severe. This is what they're gonna grow up with. And so they are the ones that really need to invest in so that they can make the changes. Because I think we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for a long time for this stuff to change, but it just hasn't. There's a resistance um, here that, you know, it's kind of, we need to break through. And I think we can do that with generational change with students. That's great. That's a great point. You know, when um, I talk to um, our donors, ISP's donors across the political spectrum, you know, the donors who give to our STEM education programs are the most interested in um, fostering the next generation of critical thinkers. Critical thinking is very important to all of them no matter what side of the fence you're on. So anyway, thank you, Jake. That was really great. It and was, it was nice to have you. Thanks for the time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. So um, thank you all for joining us today too. And um, our next event coming up is our Reimagine event. And that is Wednesday, November 10th. That is from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That is our virtual fundraiser. And um, you don't need to buy a ticket. You don't even need to make a gift. We would love it if you did. We, we're going to ask you for a gift, and we hope to inspire you to do so. But, um, but we'd love to have you join us either way. Um, the topic is going to be your immune system. And you know, given everything that we've heard about over the last year and a half with COVID, um, that's a pretty relevant topic. 
And um, one of our faculty members is going to kick us off by um, giving us the immune system 101. So we're going to start at the very beginning and walk you through it in just one hour. You'll be an, an expert in an hour. So we'd love to see you there. Um, if you're on our email list, you'll get more information about that. You can always go to our events page, isbscience.org, and click on events, and you will see all of our upcoming events. You can register for those. You will also see recordings of events just like this one you participated in. So there's a really nice um, collection of uh, recordings of talks from our scientists just like this one that you can um, spend hours looking through. And um, one last thing, if you have any suggestions for upcoming research roundtables, we'd love to hear them. Go ahead and go to our website. If there's a topic of interest to you, let us know about it. You can put it in the Q&A or the chat box right now, and we'll monitor that for the next few minutes. But we'd love to have your feedback on this series. Um, it's, it's been very popular. We're very happy with it. We started during COVID, um, and we're going to keep going with it because we have a great attendance for it. So um, send us those ideas and feedback, and that's all we have for you today. And thank you for joining us. Thank <music> you.